First, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Koten for just stepping aside on this late notice. And actually, uh, we just finished uh, a three-day session the week before uh, this. And I realized uh, like October 5th is the celebration of Bodhidharma Day. And I just began to realize this after, I'm kind of ashamed to say this, after 60 years of study, that he was one of the greatest, our greatest ancestor in our history. And uh, and and you, you see him in all, all Zendos, this uh, person with uh, glaring eyes and, and the idea of uh, the glaring eyes was that he sat uh, for a long time and then, so he wouldn't go to sleep. Uh, the, the, the legend has that he just, he cut his uh, eyelids off. So that's, so he wouldn't go to sleep, but this is just, just a metaphor, okay? So you, we shouldn't go to sleep in our everyday life. That, that's what it means. All these teachings is not about 500 or 2,000 years ago. It's about right now and what's happening. You can relate this story to Bodhidharma. It's a right now. It's, it's no, there's no other time than now. So that's, that's the inspiration I got after uh, reading this. And it's a, it's a good translation from uh, Nishijima, Shobo Genzo. Sho means uh, right. It means upright. And it's composed of five, the ideograms composed of five strokes. One, two, three, four, five. And, 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 and uh, if you go to a, uh, at least in the old days, when you went to a Chinese dim sum place, uh, they marked how many uh, dishes you ate by this character show, this five strokes, that's five dishes. You owe, you owe for five dishes or seven dishes. But it means uh, uprightness, not opposed to uh, the negative. Your uprightness, our uprightness. This is what it means, show. And so, uh, Gyoji, uh, this is a very good translation. A show begins like show, bo is dharma, means like the universe. Right dharma, gen means to see, but not just looking, realizing the treasure you have within yourself. That's the whole point, that's Shobo Genzo. Not just seeing and talking about it, but the work in realizing uh, the ineffable state that's within yourself. So uh, let's see, Goji is like in two parts. Gyo, uh, yeah, the ideogram, the old ideogram to Gyo is like an intersection. And it means, I think it means uh, some kind of action. When you come to an intersection, uh, you don't stand still, but there's some action right at that intersection, the vertical and the horizontal. Gyo. And then we have, We have Gyoji. So the first is like a, Gyo is more like a action, deeds, conduct. Um, and you could say, Ishijima uh, says that uh, the Buddha Dharma or Buddha's uh, philosophy of ultimate truth is about action. And action, doing something. Uh, and that doing something is realizing the true self that's within yourself. That's the action to be liberated from the notion that the, the self you think you are is not who you are. 
to realize yourself, to awaken, to wake up from this mirage to the, to the ultimate reality of what is happening right in front of yourself. So I'm, I'm, uh, this is my second time in reading this, maybe more than second time, but um, maybe this may be part of my talk for many talks because there's so much in it. Uh, the first ancestor in China, we're referring to Bodhidharma now, came from the West to the Eastern lands at the instruction of the Venerable Prajnatara, who, who was the 27th ancestor. And this lineage goes straight back to Buddha. And Bodhidharma is the 28th lineage holder. For three years of frost and springs during the ocean voyage, he's coming from Ceylon, Sri Lanka to China. For three years of frost and springs during the ocean voyage, how could the wind and snow have been the only miseries? Through how many formations of clouds and sea mist might the steep waves have surged? He was going to an unknown country. Ordinary beings who value their bodies and life could never conceive of such a journey. This must have been maintenance of the practice realized solely from the great benevolent will. And this benevolent will was to transmit the Dharma, transmit the Dharma, transmit the Dharma and save deluded emotional beings. This is kind of interesting. I've never heard this, uh, you just say deluded sentient beings or, but it's it, the translation, uh, Nishijima, to save deluded emotional beings. It was so because the transmission of the Dharma is Bodhidharma himself. The, uh, these few sentences I'm going to read right after this is how Dogen, uh, our ancestor, uh, presents the truth in these uh, five sentences, okay? It was so because the transmission of the Dharma is Bodhidharma himself. He was the transmission, okay? Two, it was so because the transmission of the Dharma is the entire universe. It was so because the whole universe in the 10 directions is the real state of truth. It was so because the whole universe in the 10 directions is Bodhidharma himself. It was so because the whole universe in the 10 directions is the whole universe in the 10 directions. That's, that's Dogen's uh, logic in the, in the ultimate truth. Uh, it's hard to understand, but just listen like like it was music, okay? I wrote uh, on the side here, the transmission of the Dharma is Bodhidharma. Okay, that's the first sentence. The transmission of the Dharma is the universe. Third sentence, the trans, the universal, uh, the universe in 10 directions is the truth. And the fourth one, the universe in the 10 directions is Bodhidharma. Therefore, universe and the 10 directions is the universe in 10 directions. I, I think that's great logic right there. Universe is everything. It's beyond, beyond our thinking. And, and we are part of it. The universe is our mother. Everything is part of it, interconnected. Not absolutely one thing is missing.
Okay. I, I like the closing sentence. It was so because the whole universe in the 10 directions is the whole universe in the 10 directions. What conditions surrounding this life are not a royal palace? Bodhidharma uh, was a princess. He was born, he was the third son of a king in southern India. And so he lived in a palace. And what royal palace is prevented from being a place to practice the truth? For these reasons, he came from the West like this, because the saving of deluded emotional beings is Bodhidharma himself. He was without alarm and doubt, and he was not afraid. Have you ever met someone who is not afraid? It's pretty fantastic. Because saving deluded emotional beings is the entire universe. He was not alarmed and doubting, and he was without fear. He left his father's kingdom forever, made ready a great ship, crossed the southern seas and arrived at the port of Guangzhou, that's southern China. There would have been a large crew and many monks to serve the master with towel and a jug. But historians failed to record this. After the master landed, no one knew who he was. It was the 21st day of the ninth lunar month of the eighth year in the Futsu era. That's 520, 527. That's during the Liang dynasty. The governor uh, of this district received the master displaying the proper courtesy of a host. So he sent a messenger to uh, Emperor Bu. Bu and Wu is the same. When Emperor Bu read the message, he was delighted and he dispatched a messenger with an imperial edict inviting the master to visit him. It was then the first day of the 10th month. He was, that was the ninth he came the ninth month on the 21st day, and now it's the 10th month of the first day. And this is, this is the, uh, the dialogue uh, between Master Bu and Bodhidharma, which is uh, different from any other dialogues I've read, especially this one sentence. Uh, I'll highlight it later. Uh, oh, when the first uh, ancestor arrived at the city. Uh, it was the eastern part of China facing the Yellow Sea. And he met the Liang uh, Emperor Bu. And the emperor asked Bodhidharma, it would be impossible to list all the temples built and all the sutras I had copied and all the monks delivered since I assumed the throne. What merit have I achieved? The ambassador said, no merit at all. This is, I mean, you're in front of the emperor, he could cut your head off. But Bodhidharma said, no merit. <laughs> you, get, you get no merit. Why? The master said, these things are only the trivial effects of human beings and gods and the cause of superfluous and, and the cause of the superfluous. They are like shadows following the form. Though they exist, they are not real things. What is true merit, the emperor said. The master, the pure wisdom being subtly all encompassing pure wisdom, pure prajna being 
subtly all-encompassing. The body being naturally empty and still. Virtue like this is not sought by the worldly. The emperor asked further, what is the paramount truth among the sacred truth? The master said, it is that which is glaringly evident right in front of yourself, glaringly evident and without anything sacred. The emperor said, who is this person facing me? The master said, I don't know. The emperor did not understand. The master knew that the time was not right. Yeah, the sentence, uh, when the master said, uh, after Emperor Bu asked him, what is the paramount truth among the sacred truths? And he said, is that which is glaringly evident. It means anything in front of you is the truth. It's glaring at us, but we can't see it because we try to see it. So the master left quietly, traveling north up the Yangtze River. Yangtze means Qianggong. It means long river, Yangtze. He arrived at Luoyang. He accepted a makeshift accommodation at Shurin Temple on Suzan Mountain, where he sat facing a wall in silence all day long. But the ruler of the Wei dynasty also was too inept to recognize the master, and he did not even know that this was the cause for shame. The master was from the Kshatriya caste of Southern India. He had been the crown prince of a great nation. He had long ago acquired familiarity with the ways of the royal palace of a great nation. In the vulgar customs of the small country, there were habits and views that might be shameful to the prince of a great nation. But, but the mind of the first ancestor was not moved because of this so-called shame. He did not abandon the country, China, and he did not abandon the people. At that time, he neither prevented nor hated the slander of Bodhiruchi and even, even the evil-minded precept uh, teacher, Kozu. Uh, these were monks uh, from northern India who translated the uh, Indian sutras into Chinese. And um, they were thought of be uh, very great teachers at that time. But uh, at that time, uh, Bodhidharma neither prevented nor hated the slander of these two uh, people. In fact, they tried to poison him. This is just two times. I don't know if there were other times. But Bodhidharma <laughs> did not slander nor even prevent them from doing it. He was not afraid to die. And he considered neither worthy of resentment nor even noticing. Despite the master's abundance of such virtue, people of the Eastern lands considered him the equal of mere ordinary scholar of the Tripitaka. The, the Tripitaka is like the three baskets in the, in the, the Dharma. And uh, one is the sutras, and actually, we chant sutras every 
every day. But we have no idea what it says. But it's directly related to a realized life. But they're not words. These sutras will remain forever because they are the universe. It's not philosophy. It's not ideas. It's truth. It's ultimate truth. I didn't look at sutras like that for many, many, uh, for a long, very long time. They're just sutras, just teaching. But they, they were realized from living our everyday lives through the suffering of our everyday lives and how to be liberated from the outside world. So you can be in the outside world. So in, in the morning, uh, the, there are three chants that we should know, and this is how it works. The first one is the Heart Sutra, and that's the realization of emptiness. The emptiness that is the nature of all things within the universe, including all things that are, that are all, everything is interrelated in the universe, but the nature of it is emptiness. You could say it another way, undivided, empty cognizance suffused with knowing. That's the Tibetan way of saying emptiness. Nas means cognizance. It can't just be empty. There's cognizance with it. And so the first one is uh, we realize that the nature of all things, we're, we're free from the objective world when we realize everything has the same nature, the emptiness. The second, and that's, that's uh, the heart sutra. The second sutra is the intimacy of the relative and absolute. It means subject and object are one. So it means that through our training in meditation, through our training, we see uh, uh, what happens is that the subject and object or the duality, the polarities, the dichotomies, these are what cause suffering. If they're not resolved, we suffer. If, they're, if they are resolved or actually what happens, they dissolve in meditation practice. So yet we, and that's why people like to sit meditation, but they, they have yet to, to realize that those the economy that the suffering has dissolved, but they like to. So they have yet to realize it and they need a teacher to point it out. That's what it is. Okay, that's the, that's the second one. So that's, that's the beginning end of suffering. Our dichotomies, our polarities, good and bad, right and wrong, all, all that. Okay, so a person who has, uh, train in Sanzen for a long time. When he or she goes out in the world, she will see things as not different from her. She'll see the oneness that we all came from the universe. And then when she, when she and, and she won't, see, she, she'll appreciate the oneness first. And then the second appreciation is the differences. She will appreciate that also. Normal, regular human beings, they see the differences and are overwhelmed by the, by the differences. That's why all this suffering is happening. They do not see the sameness. They do not know or even could ever imagine that we have the same mother, okay? And then the third one is the great compassion Dharani. So, so that means your wisdom and compassion is how you relate to the world. Those are the three sutras that we chant every day. And there's a reason for that.
So they just, uh, the people in the Eastern land, China and Japan, they, they just thought him as maybe just the scholar of the Tripitaka. This was extremely stupid. Dogen, <laughs> just Dogen uses these words, it, it's kind of surprising me, but actually it's words that we use too. <laughs> Okay, he says, uh, this is extremely stupid. They thought so because they were little people. Because little people think this way, <laughs> right? They were trivial people. Some thought that the master was proclaiming a peculiar lineage of the Dharma called the Zen sect. And that the sayings of other teachers, commentary teachers and the like, might amount to the same as the right Dharma of the first ancestor. They were vermin who disturbed the, and dirty the Buddha Dharma. The first ancestor was the 28th rightful successor from Buddha Shakyamuni. He left his father's great kingdom to rescue the living beings in eastern lands. Whose shoulders could come up to this? If the first ancestor had not come to the West, how could living beings of eastern lands have seen and heard the Buddha Dharma. We wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. This is true. Where would you be? Where would I be? They would have only worried in vain over sand and stones, which are names and forms. I mean, think about that. Not they, but we would only have worried in vain over the sands and stones, which are names and forms. The outer world. In vain, wasting your life. Even those who have clothed themselves in fur, worn her horns on their heads in a remote and dis distant land like ours have now become able to hear our fill of the right dharma. Now even peasants and farmers, old country folks, village children see and hear. It is totally due to the ancestral master's maintenance of the training in crossing the seas that we have been saved. The natural climate of India was vastly superior to China. And there were also great differences in rightness and wrongness in local customs. China was not a place to which great saints who had received and retained the Dharma treasure would go. Unless he or she were the person of great benevolence and great endurance. A suitable place of practice where the master might live did not even exist in China. And the person who knew about this were very few. So he hung his staff on Suzan Mountain for a spell of nine years. People called him the Brahman who looks at the wall. So uh, Bodhiruchi and, and the precept Master Kozu, the longer he stayed, the more authentic he became. How could you sit for nine years? Is he, is the guy, is, 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 is this Bodhidharma learning meditation? To, we can only sit for a couple of hours, but you know, you sit for nine years, the longer he sat, the more threatened they became. That's why they wanted to kill him. But uh, most of the people call him the Brahman who looked at the wall. 
and he was just learning Zen meditation. But it was not so. The right Dharma I treasure. It. This this is the name of this book. The oh I, I explained it earlier. The right there's show show bow. Show is right, upright, and bow is dharma. Again, uh, uh, show again, again is seeing, not just to see, but to realize what's in front of you. And and uh, Zo is treasure. That's the treasure. That's the great treasure, the ineffable treasure that we all have. Maybe I just read one more page, but the, I, I, this this uh. This is a couple more pages, so maybe it'll be a continuation, okay? So the, the people during that time who made chronicles subsequently listed him among those who were learning Zen meditation. They grouped him alongside people like withered trees and dead ash. Nevertheless, the saint did not stop at his a practice of dhyana. And at the same time, of course, he did not go against the practice of dhyana. Just as the art of divination emerges from yin and yang without going against yin and yang. When the liang Emperor Wu first met Bodhidharma, he asked at once, what is the paramount sacred truth? And the master replied, it is that which is glaringly evident and without anything sacred. The emperor went on to say, who is this person facing me? Bodhidharma said, I don't know. If Bodhidharma had not been con Confer, uh, had not been conversant with the language of that region. How could their conversation have taken place as it did at that time? So the chroniclers were uh, labeled him as learning Zen meditation. This was extremely stupid and regrettable. While the master thus continued training and practicing on Suzanne Mountain, there were dogs who just came and barked at the great ancestor. They were pitiful and extremely stupid. How could any who had the heart think lightly of the master's merciful kindness? How could anyone who has the heart not hope to repay this kindness. There are many people who do not forget even worldly kindness, but appreciate deeply. These are called human beings. The great kindness of the ancestral master is greater even than the kindness of father and mother. So do not compare the benevolence, love, of the ancestral master, even to the love of parent or child. When we consider our own lowly position, we might be alarmed and afraid. We are beyond sight of the civilized lands. We were not born at the center of civilization. We do not know any saints we have not even seen a sage. No person among us has ever ascended beyond the celestial world. People's minds are utterly stupid. Since the inception of Japan, no person has edified the common people. We hear of no period when the nation was purified. Gee, it seems like now. <laughs> We're not talking long ago. It's happening now. 
This is the lowest time in the whole world. Not just in religion, politics, you name it. Right now it's happening. Because no one knows uh, what is pure and what is impure. No, no one even says the word. These words are foreign to us. We are like this because we are ignorant of the substance and details of the two spheres of power and the three elements. The two spheres of power is the military and the civilian power. This, this was in Dogen's time too. Uh, civilian power and the military. We are like this because we're ignorant of the substance and details of the two spheres of power and the three elements, the three elements being heaven, earth, and the people. How much less could we know the rising and falling of the five elements? The stupidity rests upon the blindness to the phenomena before our very eyes. And we are blind because we don't know the sutras, nor the text, because there is no teacher of the sutra and text. There is no such teacher means that no one knows how many tens of volumes there are in this sutra. No one knows how many hundreds of verses and how many thousands of sayings there are in this sutra. We read only the explanatory aspects of the senses, not knowing the thousands of verses and the tens of thousands of sayings. Once we know the ancient sutras and read the ancient texts, then we will have the will to venerate the ancients. Because we don't understand what we're reading or studying. We don't venerate the ancients. This is really important. When we have the will to venerate the ancients, the ancient sutras come to the present. The ancient When we have the will or the determination, it takes the, re the, the resolve, your resolve. It takes the training and practice. It won't come to you. It takes training and practice. When we have what I just said, to venerate the ancients, the ancient sutras come to the present and manifest themselves right before us. Not only do the teachings come alive, but you come alive. When we were in Korea many years ago, um, there was a pilgrimage. We went to visit many temples. We came across uh, this gnarled tree without leaves and uh, the sign in front of it said is this tree alive or dead what would you say that's your question is this tree alive or dead Ancient sutras come to the present. The past makes the present. Past time becomes present.
common folk of Japan, never having been subjected to the ruler of such noble rulers, do not know what it is to learn and serve a ruler or what it is to learn to serve a parent. So we are pitiful even as subjects of a sovereign and pitiful even as members of a family, as retainers or as children, we vainly pass by one foot gems and vainly pass invaluable minutes of time. This, uh, well, anyway, that, that, I don't have to go to the footnote, but anyway, that explains it. As retainers or as children, we vainly pass by valuable one foot gems and vainly pass by invaluable minutes of time. There is no Japanese person who have, having been born into an ancestry like this, would give up an important national office. We even cling to trivial official positions. This is how it is in corrupt age. In an age of purity, such things might be rarely seen or heard. Living in a remote land like this, and possessing lowly bodies and lives like these, if we had the opportunity to hear our fill of the Tathagata's right dharma, how could we have any hesitation about losing these lowly bodies and live on the way? Having clung to them, for what purpose could we relinquish them? Even our bodies and lives were weighty and wise, we should not begrudge them to the Dharma. How much less should we begrudge bodies and lives that are lowly and mean, lowly and mean though they are, when we ungrudgingly relinquish them for the truth and for though they are. They may be more noble than the highest gods and more noble than the wheel rolling king. In some, there may be more noble than all the celestial gods and earthly deities and all living beings of the triple world. The first ancestor was the third son of the king of southern India. He was to begin with an offspring of the imperial lineage of India, a crown prince. His nobility and venerability were such that people in remote nations in the eastern lands never knew even forms of behavior by which they should serve him. There was no incense. There were no flowers. His seat and mat were scant. The temple buildings were inadequate. How much flower, how much worse it would have been in our country, the remote island of sheer cliffs. Yeah, maybe this is enough, huh? <laughs> Thank you for listening.